This is Aliens and Artists, part one of our conversation with Jennifer Sodini. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. Jennifer is an artist, podcaster, and gifted spiritual practitioner. She's had numerous astounding experiences with craft and entities. Yeah, so um, in the summer of 2014, uh, the person I was dating at the time, you know, he was a tour manager for, for this band and he had been out on tour for weeks and he was home for like a weekend and we decided to get together a group of friends and go down to the beach and just hang out. And originally we planned to like hang out, have some beers, just like have a time. But as soon as we got to the beach, uh, cop saw that we had alcohol and confiscated it. <laughs> so they were like, uh, yeah, you're getting tickets. You can't drink on the beach. They took our alcohol and we're like, well, can we just still hang out here? And they said, yeah. So we just hung out on the beach. We're having this like amazing time, great conversations, just like playful, awesome. And there were six of us about. So uh, yeah, about six people. And we started talking about Stephen Greer. And at that time, I was really into the work of Stephen Greer, like really fascinated by it, especially with the CE5 contact protocol stuff. And I had the app on my phone and I started talking about like crop circle tones and look, you know, you can play crop circle tones. So I had the crop circle tones playing on my phone. We're laughing again, having this great time, sober, dead sober. <laughs> and we look into the sky and see these two beautiful glowing orbs dancing. And the way that they were moving was almost like this double helix of DNA, like moving from one side to the other side. And we're all like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Like what, what is happening? So this goes on for about 15 minutes and it literally felt like they were dancing for us. And in my mind, because I was just like, oh my God, this proves the point that if ETs respond to higher consciousness and all we've been doing here is laughing and playful and like childlike energy and playing crop circle tones, they work. Look, <laughs> we all feel it. And it was like, we were just like so overjoyed and just feeling this excitement. And then, you know, as we're looking at this, one of the people we were with turns to, you know, my, my ex and was like, yeah, well, isn't there like other different like alien races? Aren't there like some scary ones? Aren't there like reptilians? And my ex starts talking about, we have this friend who works in fashion, who claims to be a reptilian shapeshifter from the sixth dimension. And he brought him up just in jest. And then we both look up, the scroll and I look up at the sky at the same time. And we see a gigantic black somewhat translucent triangle, like gigantic. I can't even contextualize how huge this thing was. Hover over our heads silently and go into the horizon. And this wave of terror hit through us in such a way that every time I think about it, I feel it. It was like a shock wave. And we all were like, holy shit, we have to get off of the beach. This is terrifying. What just happened? We did like in, in our brain at that moment, I'm thinking, oh my God, he was just talking about reptilian aliens. So like, this is like a reptilian craft coming for us or something, you know, all these thoughts start running through our heads. So we all rush off of the beach, run and go to my, my apartment and just try to unpack what happened to us. We're like, oh my God, what was that? All of us just completely terrified because it went from this beautiful dancing of these glowing orbs that felt like pure, beautiful spirit to this nefarious feeling black triangle hovering over us in a way that was just so frightening. Um, and it just, it shook me so much that my right arm was just shaking to the point that like I could barely hold a pen shaking so terribly. And then, you know, my ex had to go back out on tour like two days later. So we're all, they all stay. We hung out at the apartment, talk, everybody leaves. Two days later, my ex has to go out on tour and I'm just shaken shaken so deeply about what I felt, what I experienced, that, that this thing that I just have no words for. And then not a few days later, you know, I've had sleep paralysis a few times in my life. Uh, I get it a lot when I sleep on the plane where I'm sleeping and then I, I wake up and I can't move my body. But 
it's very short. It's very, uh, you know, you can tell that you're still in like a dreamy state. I've never had anything happen like this to me before or since this instance. But a few days after this happens, I'm in my apartment sleeping alone and I wake up completely paralyzed, but completely aware as if, as if I'm looking at my room right in front of me right now. And I hear people in my apartment looking through my things, talking about what books I'm reading, talking about what's in my journals, talking about all of what's in my apartment. And I'm struggling to scream and I can't scream. I'm struggling to move. I can't move. I hear this go on. And then all of a sudden, as as I'm like petrified of hearing these things in my apartment, somebody taps my right shoulder and I wake up and I can move my body again and everything's gone. Including the shaking arm? No, the shaking arm still, still when I think about it, I I get. (laughs) Oh my God. If you don't mind, I'd like to circle back and unpack some of the specific components in these experiences. What a riveting roller coaster in this constellation of encounters. To begin with, looking back on the Stephen Greer element in your experience, CE5, for those who don't know, is a set of protocols for human initiated contact with non-human intelligences. Meditation and consciousness are used to invite encounters with these NHIs. Usually at a distance, people on the ground, UFOs in the sky. I don't believe Greer invented these methods, but he popularized them. As to your experience, the way you were playfully using the CE5 app on your phone, the group of you, giddy, dancing around at such results being produced. Looking back, you do feel there was a one-to-one correlation between your intention, your meditation that conjured those first two orbs? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And did everyone else feel that to be the case in the moment? Well, the only person that I'd say that was kind of riding my my train of thought was my ex. So he was very much like uh, really into all these things, really excited about all I was learning, very much like a champion of these ideas. The other four people on the beach were just like normal down to earth people that just actually th- thought that stuff was like kind of bullshit. And uh, I think it really kind of freak them out because they're like, who, who are these crazy people? (laughs) Like what has happened? Oh my God. What an introduction to these realms. When everyone got back to the apartment, was that all anyone could talk about? Was everyone still completely freaking out, pouring over this for the remainder of the day? Oh, completely. It, It was at night. And you know, to the two guys, the one guy was like, I don't ever want to talk about this again. I don't, I don't, I don't want everyone to talk about this again. Like was really scared. Like, please don't ever bring this up. I, I just, I, I don't, I don't, I just want to pretend like this night never happened. That kind of vibe. The other guy was like, dude, what the fuck was that? You know, like, what is this? And then the one girl was very scared and she's like, listen, I can't even entertain this. Like I have, I have my nephew I have to take care of and get back home to like, I, I guess I don't even know what that was, but like, I just can't even entertain the idea of what it could be. And then the other person that, you know, she and I like locked eyes and looked up at the thing at the same time. She was, she's a very quiet person. And I think for her, it was just very traumatizing. Just being like, what was that? Yeah. It's basically a Rorschach blot of ontological shock reverberating through all six people, manifesting distinctly among each respective experiencer. Regarding the triangle craft, I know you said you don't even have a context for how large it was, but if you were to say intuitively what its size was, are we talking about a football field, several car lengths? What might be a crude approximation? Uh, uh, Imagining like maybe three, two or three stealth bombers like smashed together, like that size. Oh my God. And when that triangle craft appeared, everyone in the group shared in that sudden experience of terror and menace coming over them? Yeah, they, everybody felt it collectively. The juxtaposition between the lightness and joy to the shockwave reverberation of terror, it almost just felt like a whoosh of terror that shot through all of us. Do you feel that was conveyed or transmitted from the craft itself? See, that's the thing. 
that I uh, am not positive about because the timing was interesting that it appeared right after, you know, this person had asked a question about reptilians and then my ex are talking about like reptilian shapeshifters. So I don't know if that was just this, this seed planted. So we just felt that feeling because we thought that's what it was. Um, but it also felt like it kind of came off of that. It's been hard to unpack because when it first happened in my brain, I thought it was maybe like some some other extraterrestrial entity that that was checking us out that maybe wasn't as nice. And then it wasn't until, you know, I had interviewed, I took a, a meeting with Sean Stone, who is deep in this space and researches this stuff. And you know, he has a show on RT. And I had told him about what happened. And he saw, you know, I still have the shaking arm because that was a few weeks after it happened um, when we met. And I told him what happened. He was like, oh, this happens all the time. He's like, those lights that you saw, those are definitely something of another world. But that black triangle you saw, that's like a black budget government thing. They have satellites. So like if something like that comes and they see it appear, they send that as like a scout ship to be like, hey, what's going on here? And I'm like, oh, well, that's equally terrifying. Exactly. There's not much consolation in that concept either. No. The timing around the arrival of the triangle in relation to the orbs. Your friend asserting that it's human tech designed to disperse alien tech. Is that your sense of it? Also, what happened with the orbs when the triangle craft did show up? Did they scatter? Was there interaction among the three objects present? The orbs disappeared after the craft came. Wow. And as I said that, it just thundered right here. <laughs> Talk about timing. Wow. Uh, I, I think I would be remiss to also not mention the fact that where I've kind of landed to on the Greer stuff and just from my own subjective experience and my own opinion on it, I think it's a very dangerous thing because Greer has had this overzealousness that they're all just here to help us, that they're all benevolent, that they're all benign, that they're all just our star brothers and sisters, that they're all in a universe of billions and billions and billions of potentials in a, in a simulation of billions and billions of potentials. There is good and evil. There is bad and good. There is not just a higher evolved being that has arrived at goodness. And when you are te teaching people that it's all good, that all you're going to get is good, it's, not grounded and it it causes me room for pause because you know if he's in this space and he knows that if you're attracting these things immediately after the government craft is going to come um and I'll get into that about what happened in Egypt too I, it makes me wonder like is he like a disinformation agent is he working with them what is this i think it's good to hold all of these ideas to be like yes there are benevolent encounters yes there are benevolent things but when you're opening portals and playing with fire whether that's magic meditation extraterrestrial contact you have to have your feet on the ground and be objective and rational and say that it's not all just uh you know even in buddhism there's wrathful deities and then there's peaceful deities that's the nature of the life experience Yes, I couldn't agree more. I'd like to follow this thread a bit. I don't wish to target Greer disproportionately, but he is a useful figure to orient this aspect of our discussion. I will grant him credit where credit is due, the Disclosure Project. Greer got hundreds of government and military officials to go on video making statements on record as to the reality of these phenomena. Then, as to his CE5 protocols, ostensibly they work. When someone such as yourself employs these tools and sees such instant results, that's remarkable. Consciousness can be focused and marshaled by the average citizen to elicit a response from non-human presence. So, we can have admiration for Greer's contributions in these respects, while also recognizing the flip side, which is, his charging people thousands of dollars to participate in CE5 events with an explicit stipulation that participants cannot be critical or skeptical of any aspects of their experiences. It's just a bit cultish. It's rigid. It's not healthy. What about maintaining flexibility and openness to adjust our worldview 
if contravening evidence or experience enters into the equation, as it did in your experience, which began with joy and wonder and progressed quickly to terror and panic. And it disrupted your life in a very severe fashion. It was traumatic. There are very problematic features in play, and they need to be addressed head on. I share your view that not all of these entities are malevolent, but inversely, they're not all benevolent. One thing I love about your handling of these events is that I don't feel you demote yourself or project your higher self onto these beings. As you've moved forward and grown in the intervening years, have your modifications and insights resulted in the stabilization of your life? Have you been free of negative experiences since then? And if yes, to what do you attribute that freedom? Mm, that's such a good question. So, I mean, since since that had happened, pretty shortly after that, I started having these experiences with channeling. And there was like a three-year period where I was going into trance and receiving information through that state. And that was its own like wild goose chase of consciousness information. But it wasn't until 2016 that I, I closed the door on that and really just tried to focus deeper into more grounding, more, uh, you know, again, you're playing with fire and all of these realms. And you know, I've had some challenging uh, journeys. Uh, back in in December, I had a really challenging ayahuasca experience, which really shook me because it really showed me a lot of this stuff. There's that whole conspiracy of like how like aliens or demons and this, that, and the other thing. And I just had this like demon night where I felt the weight of a lot of the saccharine new age practices that are coming into the mainstream and being commercialized and turned into like no big deal summoning this it, it's 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 dangerous territory and that really shook me to such a degree that again i'm actually very grateful for it because i would rather operate in the space where i'm not tampering with forces that are beyond my control because it's scary, you know, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you don't don't adopt a thing as the the ultimate truth that this is the ultimate benevolence. I think one of the things that I think has been the most valuable lesson in it all is having a deeper sense of discernment and awareness of you are treading a dangerous path if you don't have the spiritual hygiene or logic countered with reason and, and intuition when it comes to these spaces because it can be really traumatizing and affect your life in, in ways that I don't even think you could fully grasp. Does that make sense? Completely. I want to ask more about hygiene in a bit, but before that, let me ask if you feel the onset of the channeling was precipitated in any way by the arrival of the UFO sightings or the events surrounding those sightings. Did channeling appear of its own accord, independent of those other events? I think that they were also interwoven. Uh, when the channeling started, it was pretty soon after the people in the apartment. And what came through was very celestial feeling, and the feeling and the experience and language in all of it. And I definitely think that they were intertwined because as that door opened, all of this other high strangeness happened. You know, somehow I found myself at this weird event where like I was listening to Edward Snowden talk and like being asked to, there was this summit that I got invited to participate in. And meanwhile, I'm the only one like me there. And we were drafting plans for what the world would look like in a future without money and that they were being sent to the UN. And I'm like, how did I get here? What am I doing here? And then like this recreational paranoia sets in and it's like, am I, is this just happening or is this all intertwined? I have an experience on the beach. I have the thing in the apartment, the channeling starts and I start getting dropped into these really weird situations. What does it mean? Um, I definitely think there's a very weird web that formed from that moment, even into now. Is channeling or other paranormal talent something that runs in your family? 
it's funny because my mom is not into spirituality, but she's always witnessed my innate gifts, you know, being the mother of a child that would have dreams and tell her that the dreams, what the dreams were and see them unfold and come true. And this morning she was talking again about how when I was little and she's like, Jen, you know, even when you were a baby, you were just talking about ET stories, begging me to tell you ET stories, thinking about outer space. She's like, I just, I never could wrap my head around it. That's been it. Like since I was a child, I've always felt this connection, this homesickness for something beyond uh, deep dreams coming true. And, you know, I, my mother, like I said, was, is not really into spirituality, but I grew up spending a lot of time with my grandparents and my grandmother, who's actually, you know, my father's mother, she was very much into the occult and was a student of Aleister Crowley. Uh, her mother was in the order of the Eastern Star that she had this very occult kind of proclivities to her. She had this mysterious oracle deck of unknown origins to this day. We don't know where it came from, how she got it, because she unfortunately passed away when I was 12. But she never made me feel afraid of my gifts and really tended to them, letting me practice with these oracle cards, teaching me how to use my intuition, how to look beyond. It was really important to her that uh, I have an understanding of art and culture and history. So it was a really unique kind of template for the rest of my life, this interweaving of the occult, intuition, oracle, and art and culture. She was a student of Crowley. Did she speak to you of those teachings? Was that part of what you were brought into contact with at that young age? Um, very loosely, she'd mention it. You know, she had, I still have her copy of Crowley's Magic with all of her notes and uh, underlining and all of the, all of the things. <laughs> but I, I really think she took it to a dark place. She was really into witchcraft and demonology. And she, I think, had a lot of regrets in her life because she had my dad, I think around like 18 or 19, really young. And I think in another timeline, if she didn't get married young and have children, she would have wanted to be a doctor or a psychologist or do something. She was just so ahead of her time. But, you know, at that time, the 50s, she had a, her son and had her daughter, then had her other son and life got in the way. And I think she turned to magic as a way to cope. But I think it, she was more drawn to the darker side of things. Beyond the Crowley and magic and adopting a set of skills, attending that occult work, did E.T.'s figure anywhere in that mix, in what she was relating to you, or perhaps in her own experiences, or just in the broader cosmology of that esoteric work? I think within the broader cosmology of it, because, you know, she, I always was asking her about aliens. She would encourage me and buy books. Um, I think she's actually the one who bought me my copy of Communion, which I read at a like ridiculously young age think she was equally as fascinated by it and also really, I think, intrigued by the fact that this little kid was always like wondering about the stars and beyond. When did your life shift from an initial exploration of it, a childhood emulation of your grandmother following in her footsteps? When did that turn into experiences and what was their nature? Well, my grandmother died, uh, I was around 12 or 13 years old. And after she died, I remember the day that we spread her ashes, being in my grandparents' house and looking up and seeing this green orb just circling up above me, making really interesting patterns. And that always stuck with me, you know, wondering what that was. But her dying, I think, really pushed me onto a quest to understand what it's all about like life, death, magic, why? <laughs> I think that was like the initiation into the big overarching why. And after she died, I kind of, I think, went more down towards the witchcraft route, wondering about how to kind of harness my power to find some semblance of control when things felt so out of control. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. But, you know, being 12, 13, around seventh grade when this was all happening. Uh, <laughs> I was, I grew up in an area where that was very much frowned upon. The fact that I grew up without religion, I wasn't baptized. That was one, another thing all 
of itself. You know, my next door neighbor is telling me I'm going to purgatory because I was never baptized. Then I'm in this waspy school talking about magic and oracle cards and witchcraft. And I got bullied a lot because of it. So I think I started to suppress a lot of it in high school. I always was like the parlor trick because I've been able to read oracle cards since I was a kid and high school parties are really, Jen, bring your oracle cards. I just, I kind of closeted a lot of that out of fear of judgment and just wanting to be accepted. And that really carried through until probably about my, when my dad died, (laughs) you know, just closeting those gifts out of fear. Did you feel any temptation to invoke retribution against your bullies? Did you experiment at all with responses using magic? Because that seems like a natural temptation for a beginner who's getting pushed around. It was tempting, but you know what's funny is that the most tempting thing was not to cause harm, but to be loved. So when I was younger, I did a lot of love magic. And I remember one of the times when I was like 12 or 13, I, I had like cast a spell on someone. And literally every time I did this invocation, he would call me. And it was like the weirdest thing where I was like, wow, this stuff works. Um, and it was a form of candle magic. But there is always a cost and a price for these things. And when you're tampering with someone's free will, I think it can get very dangerous. So you make a sacrifice to get a thing and then <laughs> you could really kind of get kind of karmic retribution. I think, you know, even segueing into the spiritual hygiene of all of these things, a lot of the lessons that I've learned from these experiences in ineffable realms or cosmic powers have really shown me the power of discernment when it comes to this practice. We will definitely get into spiritual hygiene, but to add a bit of color to your last point, what might be a consequence to the spell caster of a magic working like that? As in, okay, that worked, but this is the cost of those (laughs) rituals and it's too high. Yeah, I would say that the cost of that is a lot of bad luck, a lot of loss on the other end end of it. Every time when I was younger and practiced any sort of like love magic, on the other hand of it was a lot of bad luck and loss in my subjective experience. And that seems to be the case, you know, if any, if you dive deeper into any of these occult rituals, there is a price to pay for all of the things that you get. It's like if you give a moose a muffin, that kid's story. It, it's never ending. But I think when you're tampering with free will, that gets to dangerous territory. I do recall there was a point in your teenage years when it got dark. The gravity and the intensity was too much, and you stopped. Can you share what it was like to cross that fulcrum? Why did it become so clear you would stop at that time? When it comes to these practices, there's a weight, right? So there's consequence, there's price, there's cost, but there's weight when you're working in in realms beyond. And when you begin to feel heaviness, darkness, the weight, the gravity of action, that can be a really humbling experience because on the other end of it, there's lightness. You know, when you're practicing acts of selflessness or for the betterment of humanity or for not selfish gain, there's a lightness. You know, you feel an expansion as opposed to a retraction. And when you feel that heaviness, that darkness, it can be very humbling and very frightening in the same sense. So, you know, putting things to bed when they need to be put to bed and and maybe shifting your focus is really necessary because I think you're tampering with things that are so beyond human comprehension. When you open up that portal, you open up the portal to all of it. After that shift, did you engage the obverse? countering it with new light measures and practices? Yes, completely. (laughs) Yeah. And what did those include? Meditation, selfless acts, service, trying to really do without quid pro quo, not give without with expectation, Um, shifting to practices that were more for the betterment of, of the world, not just material gain and selfish selfishness. It's pretty wild. It sounds like by the time you had gone through your teens, you'd already gone through several developmental stages that many adults never make it through. (laughs) Yeah. That's a deep 
variety of precociousness. I recall there was a resurgence of the esoteric or mystical in your 20s. Is that when this all came back online? It was about like mid-20s. So after my dad, I was in the room when my dad passed away. I actually was holding his hand when he transitioned. And that was kind of like a, a little shimmering of a reunion with the spiritual realities because when my dad died, he was in a room alone and as his, when his spirit left his body, the TV shot on, this whole energy flowed throughout the room. Everybody felt it. There was no remote, no reason why that television should have turned on. And then when I got in my car to drive away from the hospital, my radio, I went to put on um, Sia's Breathe Me, which was kind of like my theme at that time and a way to cope because I love Six Feet Under and that's the the kind of ending season song. It felt appropriate and my ra car radio glitched. All the radio numbers started getting all warbled. It was crazy. So like there's that never happened before. So I felt it and then I remember going to visit family friends down in Louisiana and I woke up in the middle of the night and I had a conversation with my dad. He was sitting on the edge of the bed as clear as day. But that happened, but then all this other trauma happened and I just went deep into materialism again where I just only cared about going out in New York and partying and being, you know, cool, whatever that means. But then it wasn't until 2012, you know, my dad died in 2006 and then in 2012 I had this awakening, ironically when I was working in pop culture, but, you know, I started researching the Mayan calendar thinking it was going to be the end of the world. My dreams started getting so intense, dreaming about storms and floods and evacuation and all of this really, really intense feeling. And then Hurricane Sandy hit and then the Sandy Hook shootings happened and those dreams stopped and other dreams began. And it was just this whole portal of initiation back into what I always knew, but I had been suppressing and it was intense. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because it's like around the time of my Saturn return and Saturn archetypally is the god of time. And you think of Kronos, that Goya's painting Saturn devouring his son. It's kind of like the devourer of all the things that no longer are you. That was that time. Can I ask what the conversation was that you had with your father on the bed? So it was more of a feeling and laughter. So I just remember him laughing and being happy and feeling okay. And it was just this joyful feeling. Um, no fear, no, no sadness, just happiness. Was your dad spiritual? No, <laughs> not at all. My, you know, my dad was a athlete. He played professional basketball in Italy and, you know, he went to college for basketball and then got involved in the family business and definitely not a not a sliver of spirituality and then my mom she's a flight attendant and has had some very strange experiences and doesn't know what she believes but not no my mom my mom doesn't even like reading books wow oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. do you feel like the reemergence of your spiritual gifts was part of a natural pattern where periods of our life are characterized by intake and then other periods feature more output in an ebb and flow throughout the years? Or did it come back stronger asserting itself because it had been denied, because it had been put into a dormancy? I think it was because it had been put into a dormancy. When it came back into, into the field, I was in a relationship with somebody that was hyperlogical. You know, he's literally like a computer programmer, so he thinks in zeros and ones. And anytime I tried to read cards for him or talk about spiritual things, even before this, it would be irrational. That was actually like the big, big reason why why it ended because I just was like, I can't be with somebody that can't even take in my experience at all. So it was really interesting to be met with the polar opposites of like, we all have right brain, left brain. <laughs> I was like looking at the left brain and then, you know, in the right brain of intuition. So it was interesting to kind of have the dormancy resurge when I'm in a situation where I'm being met with like pure logic and no 
imagination whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, all transrational events look irrational to a strictly rational worldview. It's going to increasingly be an issue across the planet for centuries to come. These high strange events do not distill well into a rational worldview. When we try to modulate non-ordinary experience down to something palatable in consensus reality, the animating locus is lost in that translation. Do you feel this negotiation is something you've grown into, resolving your experiences with rational, skeptical, dismissive debunkers? Have you ignored them or developed a strategy? I feel like it's been invaluable to navigate conversation in that space. The art of nuance, the art of metaphor, the art of trying to relay an idea through question instead of just telling what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been really a gift in a lot of ways to try and articulate that experience from an arc that has a little bit of science or can be more questioning. So I think, I think a lot of the issues that the more science-minded people find with the spiritual space is just the overzealousness of this is what it is, you know, stay woke, that kind of thing. <laughs> there has to be a way where they can intersect, you know, the Venn diagram of things. It's like science and spirit. It's not mutually exclusive. And I think of that quote, uh, it's a Kierkegaard quote, the ultimate paradox of thought is to want to think a thing that thought itself cannot think. And if you look at the hermetic principle of the universe is mind, the all is mind, the universe is mental as, okay, so we're a thing thinking itself. And then if science is to say, well, everything, if the deeper you dig, the emptier it gets, how can you find a way to like cross pollinate these ideas? Like what is emptiness? But unfilled space of mind what is mind but a scientific term that's yet to be completely defined it's an interesting exercise and conversation and and the art of that you know art articulating experiences that shouldn't be dismissed just like any scientific thesis you have to test and see and yeah to be so finite and i, and I answer that spirituality is irrational or you know extraterrestrials are thinking about that as irrational or the experiences that you had are not rational. That's like gaslighting somebody. Yeah. I love that you bring in art as a tuning fork to bring more harmony. To use a musical analogy, one way to conceive of the self is as a choir of perspectives. And the rational voice in that choir, the rational perspective, is beautiful. It's needed but it's not the whole choir, nor do we want a never-ending rational solo from that voice, so to speak. Because to create symphonic work, all the voices need to be able to sing. And there needs to be a choir director. We don't want that beautiful rational tenor throwing a coup and attempting to conduct the entire choir. The other thing that's fascinating about the rational bandwidth is that where these enigmas are concerned, is how recently it appeared. Even in the arc of human development, in the history of bipedal hominids, rationality is a new shiny toy. It's a thin veneer atop a richly stratified consciousness. Understandably, we wax rhapsodic for the new toy, but I can feel your life as a beautiful integration of all that has come before and all that will come with that skillful ability to include and embrace even those aspects which may superficially appear to be in opposition. Were there events earlier in your life before the 2014 event, that sea change experience on the beach, which may have had non-ordinary characteristics, that may have connections to the craft or the orb events? More in the dream state, dream state contact. There had been a few kind of anomaly experiences in front of my grandparents' house, but probably the most significant was the one with the orbs that we'd factor into. And, you know, obviously we'll talk about what happened in Egypt as well. But uh, that was the one that summer of 2014 that really uh, shook me in a way that. I still think about and 
get the shaking arm. <laughs> I definitely think there's a very weird web that formed from that moment, even into now. Be sure to catch part two of our conversation with Jennifer Sodini, where we discuss her astonishing sightings in Egypt at the Great Pyramid. It's an unforgettable account. For more information on Jennifer Sodini, go to jennifersodini.com or check the show notes. One interesting source for contact and sightings are early historical documents and diaries. Unlike now, a period such as the 1920s allows for a clear distinction between man-made technology and something truly exotic and inexplicable. Artist Nikolaj Rorich lived in the 1920s. He was an acclaimed painter and also a Buddhist scholar, which is why he spent years traveling through Mongolia, China, India, and Tibet. As an artist traversing the top of the world for inspiration and insight, Rorich had an encounter that baffles readers to this day. In his diary, Altai Himalaya, Rorich wrote on August 5, 1926, quote, something remarkable. We were in our camp in the Kukunor district, not far from the Humboldt chain. In the morning, about half past nine, some of our caravanners noticed a remarkably big black eagle flying above us. Seven of us began to watch this unusual bird. At the same moment, another one of our caravanners remarked, there is something far above the bird and he shouted his astonishment. We all saw, in direction from north to south, something big and shiny reflecting the sun, like a huge oval moving at great speed. Crossing our camp, this thing changed its direction from south to southwest, and we saw how it disappeared in the intense blue sky. We even had time to take our field glasses and saw quite distinctly an oval form with a shiny surface, one side which was brilliant from the sun." End quote. This artist, in 1926, hiking on top of the world, spotted a metallic egg crossing the sky, got out his binoculars, and took a closer look. Of course, accounts of ovoid craft in the UFO literature have since become too numerous to count. How far back do these experiences go? Perhaps they even precede artists themselves. There's an entire museum in New York dedicated to Rorich's work. Check the show notes to find a link to that site. Aliens and Artists is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, offering one-on-one -on -one sessions with me, Stuart Davis. Sessions focus on spirituality, creativity, and a variety of paranormal experience. Go to theliminalmuse.com to book a session. Close.